Hello and welcome to another video on control systems. In the last video we showed you how the Laplace transform could be used to simplify the computation of first order circuits. In this video we will show you how to formulate the transfer function for various devices. In the last video the transfer function was for a low pass filter and you can see it embedded in the operation. If you take the last equation and move the input over to the other side under the output you should get the control function as shown there and we will now proceed second order circuits. Let's consider a serial RLC circuit. There you can see it and we want to measure the voltage across the capacitor which will serve as our output. So we write an equation for the output and then we write an equation for the input voltage and then we replace I as shown. And that is our transfer function. If we want to find the output, all we simply do is multiply the transfer function by the input to get the output. So you could say that the transfer function is the equation that describes the dead network, if that's what you want to say, because we can take an input and multiply it by the transfer function to find the output. Well, you can study this uh, mass, it's relatively simple and we will move on now to the parallel case. So if we have a parallel RLC circuit as shown, we want to use the same output across the capacitor. Well, in fact, it's across all the elements. As you can see, there is only one voltage in the entire setup. But we're going to drive it this time with a current, a constant current. And in all of these expressions, we're assuming that the capacitor is totally uncharged at the beginning of the operation. So you write the equation and simplify it. And once again, we have the transfer function for the parallel case with the stated inputs and outputs. We're now going to move on to a motor, a DC motor, and see how we can get the transfer function for a DC motor. There are two types of DC motors. One type feeds a variable current into the armature to control the speed and the other type feeds the variable control into the field coils to control the speed. In these cases, in all these cases, we're using a linear, a linear approximation and we're neglecting uh, things like hysteresis and other small details that would have minimal effect on our overall result. We will also indicate the variables that could potentially cause a problem. For example, in this case, we're assuming that the field is unsaturated, which would be a normal as uh, assumption for low current conditions. 
Now we're labeling all the various variables as we go along. The field current is related to the flux in the air gap by a constant of proportionality since we're trying to keep the whole thing linear. And we see that the armature current is related to the torque and connected to the same air flux. Magnetic flux in the gap by another constant of proportionality. So we have this linear relationship between the currents and the torques. Assuming rather a lot, but it's pretty okay for most small motors that are not being stressed out near their maximum capabilities. We have to either keep the field current constant and vary the armature current to control the motor speed, or else we have to do the reverse. One must be kept constant. So let's go with the field current control and we'll keep the armature constant for this Part. So we're writing some equations there that relate the torque to the current using one constant, Km, as the motor constant. And then we're connecting the voltage and current in the field coils and the RF and LF shown there are the resistance and inductance of the field coils respectively. Now we make a note here of the fact that the motor torque and the load torque may not necessarily be the same thing because we could have what is called there a disturbance in the torque which could result as an example we're trying to move an antenna and we have wind forces against it. Or in my initial example, if you're trying to move rudder fins on aircraft or whatever, you could have forces of wind to counteract as well. So those are disturbances in the system which are not constant and may or may not cause problems with the system and with your modeling of the system but we are going to neglect this disturbance in our simple calculations that we're doing now. Now we also have to consider the rotating inertia and, and its connection to the load torque. So that is shown with that expression there where J is the inertia and B is the friction. Okay, so we're ready to rearrange these equations. You can go back and copy them down on a paper if you want. But we're ready to rearrange these equations in a form that we can connect them and use them to establish an overall equation that when multiplied by the input variable control current leads us to an angular displacement. Okay, so we're going to assume that the disturbance torque is zero and we're going to develop these equations. You can follow my steps there to show all the steps as to how we get to this final expression where we have the motor constant to the top and the other factors to the bottom. Notice that our input is the field voltage 
and our output is an angle that's turned within a certain amount of time, of course. Okay, so let us look at the armature situation now. This is the armature current control DC motor. Now these motors are, can have a permanent magnet for the field. Many of them do. Many of these small DC motors, they feed the current into the armature coil, but the outer field magnetic flux is generated by a permanent magnet, so there is no field current at all. But the equations that we're developing here for you indicate the situation. In the top expression where we're looking at the torque of the motor, there is a field current mentioned. But if the motor has no field current at all, it's a permanent magnet motor, then Km will just be the constant that relates the armature current to the torque of the motor. Okay, so now RA plus SLA is the resistance and inductance of the armature coil, where IA and VA are the current and voltage on the armature coil. Now the armature, because it's spinning in a magnetic field, will generate some back EMF proportional to the motor speed. This is shown as another term in the equation VBS there. And VBS is related by another constant of proportionality, KB, to the speed omega. And omega is related to the actual angular position as shown in the bottom using our wonderful variable s. So we simply rearrange that expression to make the current the subject of it. And then we go on to write an equation that will give us the angular position. So this is the culmination of combining quite a few equations but we show how we develop it and rearrange it into a form so that we can get, first of all, there we're trying to get the angle um, combined on one side, and then we're going to divide the equation so that we have Km on top and Va underneath or angular displacement. So this gives us the transfer function for the armature control DC motor. You can slowly go back and study the algebra. The last thing we're going to do before we wrap up this video is take a look at the block diagrams that result from these equations. We can draw a block diagram to indicate the various equations and how they occur in the motor control model. As you can see, these elements and the lines between the elements refer to specific variables and equations within the overall transfer function. So um, this case of the armature control motor actually has a feedback loop. So that gives you an introduction to that. We're going to see the feedback loop now. It goes back from the speed to the beginning 
and it's connected by the constant KB. And of course, that is the back EMF that we mentioned before. So once again, these are pretty explanatory when you compare them to the equations that have just been developed. But you're going to have to go back and watch this slowly over a couple of times to be able to follow everything. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.